Yeah. This conference will now be recorded. And hopefully you walk away from today with a uh, better understanding on which you previously may have. Uh, I do see we had, we've got a few, few users here um, that have, that have uh, had it for some time. Uh, so hopefully as a refresher, hopefully you guys will uh, at least pick up one thing or um, bring it back to your memory as well. So with that said, let's, uh, let's get cracking. Okay, so the term attract device, the T3i, it's a three in one uh, sensor unit. So we have a radar sensor, uh, which detects movement within and beyond building materials. Uh, it does operate off microwaves, uh, microwave emission from the device. It is fairly low, but for health and safety reasons, we don't recommend holding it against your body or pointing it at your face and so forth. Um, I suggest when you're talking about it uh, to customers or, or people outside of our, our immediate industry, don't refer to it as microwaves uh, or even a radar sensor, to be honest. Uh, I just prefer to call it a motion sensor to anyone outside of the uh, outside of the industry, if you will. Then we have a thermal sensor. Uh, so is it, a, it is a spot thermal sensor. Um, now there is a, a laser pointer as a guide which comes out of the end of that as well. Uh, obvious reasons, don't go pointing that in people's faces uh, and so forth. And then we have a moisture sensor. So there is two modes uh, on the moisture sensor and obviously moisture. Uh, moisture is the root of all evils evil in buildings as far as buildings are concerned uh, for numerous reasons but for us obviously moisture is the is the attractive for termites uh, so we we need to know what's going on in buildings so having a good quality moisture sensor at your disposal uh, is paramount to what we're trying to achieve as well so we have all those sensors on the unit <laughs> and uh, and i will run through each one of those for you as well so as you're aware uh, the Australian Standards for Inspections uh, 3660.2 was updated in 2017 uh, and part of that now we have a new section in there uh, under specialist tools heading and it does list termite radar unit, termite detector animal and thermal imaging camera. Uh, so a competent inspector should have one or more of these at their disposal uh, to be able to use. So. Uh, it is good that our industry is starting to recognise technology as well. Um, moving forward, we've come a long way from uh, carrying a screwdriver and a pocket knife. Uh, so utilising modern technology at our disposal is great. However, we, we do need to understand how it works. Um, as with all these devices listed here, obviously the term track, we're here doing a training session today. It is the only radar unit available. Uh, on the market currently, uh, detector animal. Not ever, not everyone is a dog handler um, or an animal person, so it's not just a matter of getting a dog that sniffs things out and away it goes. You do have to do a lot of training and upkeep with them as well, uh, and also thermal imaging camera. There is a lot involved with that. It is more than just grabbing it, pointing it at a wall, uh, and thinking you can see what's going on. Uh, there is a lot to thermography. Um, whether some people that have them want to admit it or not, uh, but the recommend recommendation actually is to uh, is to do a thermography course uh, for thermal imaging as well. As good as these tools are, uh, and and the term track is, uh, it does not take away what we need to be doing on an inspection. We still need to do a regular visual uh, inspection procedures. So there is timber sounding, there is moisture sensing. Uh, visually having a look, feeling along surfaces, oblique lighting techniques and such. We cannot get away from doing that, does not matter what other tools you have. We have to do that basic and then it's from that basic regular, uh, regular visual inspection that we're doing. Uh, any other clues or cues that pop up, something that seems a bit suspect, at least we have other tools to be able to help us uh, with our determinations uh, and, and uh, accurate findings. Uh, Hanson, the Termitrack is a very good device for that. 
uh, having a three sensors built in. Okay, so again, the basics, so apologies to those of you that have had the device for some time and you and you fully understand how to turn it on and so forth, but uh, we need to cater to uh, those that do not have it as well. Uh, so quite basic, turning it on, five AA batteries to power the device. Uh, there is 10 in your kit, so installing five in the correct manner. Uh, what we will see uh, when we... Uh, install the batteries is the LED lights will flicker and change colors across the four posts. Now it's doing a self-diagnostic check at that point in time. So if everything checks out all right the lights will go out. So if all the lights go out after battery installation we're good to go we just hit the power button press on and off green light will come on uh, and we're good to go with the app connection. If any lights stay on at that diagnostic process there is an issue uh, or there is a, a problem that needs to be looked at. Uh, it can be as simple as uh, flat batteries or low, fault, uh, low voltage uh, with the batteries. So what we recommend is replacing the batteries, putting in another set of five batteries just to rule out any issues with the batteries you had in there. Uh, if, you come to, uh, if you come to the case of uh, all lights going out, great. The previous battery is probably a little bit flat charge them up and uh, those ones will be good. If the lights stay on again, take note of which light, which post, um, get in touch with Termitrack, uh, support or give them a phone call and uh, they will let you know what the issue is and how it can be rectified. All right, so once we've got it on, we need to connect to the Android based app. So open the app on your device. Hit the connect button. Uh, if you've been paired and been using it with that device, it will uh, automatically connect. Green power light will change to blue, and you'll note that the app will change into color mode on the screen as opposed to grayscale. Each time we use a sensor, we'll have another light on. Green and blue for radar, blue and blue for moisture, red and blue for the thermal sensor. All right, so as far as batteries go, the biggest killer of batteries uh, is actually leaving them in the device. Even if the device is turned off, uh, it will drain against those batteries. Uh, it'll get to the point where it takes them um, to zero and sometimes they cannot be picked back up again, even with the charger. Uh, so it is recommended to remove all batteries when you're not using the device. Um, if you're on the job, for example, and you're not going to be using it for a little while, I do re recommend at least removing one, turning the top one around, breaking that circuit. But when you store the device, uh, finish with it for the day, uh, do remove all batteries. Uh, it just reduces any risk uh, or any chance of any corrosion setting in in terminals uh, and that extra depletion and damage to batteries. Now there is a, a battery, uh, battery level indicator on the app screen. Uh, you'll see here below the sensor icons. Uh, that little symbol is batteries. When they're charged, it'll be in green. Uh, charge rate goes down. It'll eventually change to yellow. When that symbol does change yellow, uh, replace your batteries. Uh, put in your next set of batteries ready to go. Now, 10 batteries are supplied in the kit. They are all the same batteries. So, strongly suggest marking five batteries, uh, putting X dots. Uh, ones, whatever you want to do as your mark, uh, purely it's to distinguish that you have two sets of five batteries. Uh, that way you're using the same five batteries together over and over. Uh, I don't have any scientific data to back me up here, uh, but I've just found over the last 15 years or so that uh, in doing that it seems to prolong the life a little bit. Plus it helps you keep in order um, of which batteries are flat, which need charging and so forth. And that is very important. Uh, worst thing with anything that needs batteries is if it, the batteries are flat, you can't use your device. Uh, so get into a good routine, uh, battery maintenance and so forth, uh, and it'll stand you in good stead. Now, if you're in a business where it's uh, multiple users per device um, within your company, come up with a way that everyone knows what they're doing with the device, uh, particularly battery maintenance as well. Um, little note you can see on that device, on the battery cover, please remove all batteries after use. So just as long as everyone understands and whose responsibility for charging and so forth, it'll make uh, everyone's life a lot easier. 
So the radar sensor for movement, it is a highly accurate tool. It's a tool to aid in the confirmation of, of termites or other movement, um, other insects with movement as well. So it can be used for anything that moves essentially. Uh, primarily, obviously, we're talking about termites today and that's initially what the device was, uh, was intended for. Uh, but obviously over the years, you've seen that uh, there is benefit to using it with other other insects, uh, depending on your location and what services that uh, that you provide. So confirming movement, confirming extent of activity, proving or disproving activity. So we see uh, some damaged timber uh, or damaged area somewhere or other, instead of poking and prodding, ripping it apart to see what's happening or just writing off that it's old damage, uh, we can uh, check whether there's actually active termites within the damaged area. Remember, there is no such thing as old damage. It's either active or inactive. So having a way of being able to do that without any further or possible further disturbance uh, of any activity which may be there, uh, it's a very easy way of doing it. Now, it is non-invasive. Uh, meaning it does reduce the need to uh, open the walls or open the areas, uh, drilling holes and so forth, the cameras. Now, it does not remove the need uh, altogether, but it certainly does reduce it. So that comes in handy in uh, quite a few situations, uh, predominantly uh, in pre-purchase uh, pre scenarios where we shouldn't be doing, doing anything over and above what the, uh, what the standard service entails. Standard inspection entails there, so uh, you certainly don't want to be going to doing extra disturbance as well. Uh, too many times when uh, certain inspectors that don't actually do treatments and so forth, they go in and they rip their bus things and go, there you go, there's termites there. Oh, by the way, now you've got to go get someone who knows how to treat them. And we go along to treat them, we go, great, it's all been pulled apart, it's all been disturbed. Thank you, inspector, for that. Uh, now you've just made the job more difficult. So to avoid any of those situations, uh, obviously using this device certainly does help. Tracking, termite management, uh, we're working on numbers essentially. Uh, we're pretty spoiled for choice nowadays with what products we can, we can use uh, for treating active termites. We have come a long way from squirting in a bit of arsenic dust here and there. So we do have other uh, safer options in dust nowadays. Uh, also, uh, there is foaming agents um, that we can use as well, but also baiting. Obviously, we know that to be IGRs, uh, and uh, all of them relies on having the numbers. So it's the amount of termites, that, most amount of termites that we can get with the treatment product at the time. So instead of just looking at an area and oh, there's a bit of damaged skirting board there, I'll squirt a bit of juice in that and, that, and that'll fix the problem. Well, invariably it doesn't fix the problem uh, at all, particularly with foams, you've uh, chased them out of that area, you've treated, but you still don't know where any of them else are or how they got in. So it's only essentially not even half the job uh, doing that. So knowing the full extent of termite activity, where they're traveling to and from, uh, hopefully getting close down to the uh, entrance points, of uh, termites into the structure uh, is a big advantage. So spending your time with the device, tracking them, uh, marking the walls with uh, pencil or chalk and using that as stepping stones as you go along certainly makes that process a whole lot easier. Uh, yes, there is time involved uh, to do it, but anything that's worth doing is worth doing correctly. Uh, and if it takes time, it takes time. It's all chargeable and hours. And what you will find is it does save you time in the long run uh, by your follow-ups because you are doing precise placement of your treatment product. You're getting it where it needs to be in the most effective manner and covering the most amount of termites uh, coming into contact with them as you can. So all in all, it does save you time and money in the long run if you spend the time initially to do it. So the positioning of the radar, uh, it is uh, always better to be flush to the material that we're trying to penetrate, uh, reducing any air gap, which uh, which can reduce then the, the, the penetrative abilities uh, of the device into the material. 
Some emission though, however, can be reflected off the surface, uh, in particular high gloss, smooth high glossy type materials and surfaces. Uh, we can get some sideway emission uh, reflection, if you will. Uh, so obviously we need to be sure that uh, we aren't creating any movement uh, that the microwaves are, are detecting or nothing close by uh, is moving. So always look around when you are using it in that sense. Uh, or set it up and move away from it. Your Bluetooth uh, certainly enables us to do that, the viewing screen further away from it. That way there's no, no outside influence. Uh, now, as far as the smooth glossy material goes, uh, yes, even being flush, it does. If you move anything close by it, it will register on that. Uh, it's just the in, um, inherent of uh, microwave technology, how it actually works, that uh, creates that little issue. However, getting around that uh, emissions fill issue, just using a little piece of cardboard in between the device and the material certainly dampens that as, uh, as, uh, as an issue at all. So uh, very important to understand what's going on in that sense. So the radar field of view on the bottom face of the device. Uh, if, you dev if you have your device with you, uh, if it's turn turned off, you can look on it. Uh, or look into the face. Uh, and on the lower section, you'll see the circular area with little indents. Now, if we, if we draw a perfect square, or assume a perfect square around that area, that is the field of view. So it's roughly 35 millimeter square. Um, and that is it, it comes out in a straight line. It does not flare out, it goes out in a sort of a square fashion, if you will. So the positioning is everything. Um, a few millimeters one way or the other, uh, can be the difference between detecting the activity or missing it altogether. Uh, particularly if you're sitting on the ground, uh, on the floor, into the wall. Obviously we have floor coverings uh, in, in most scenarios, now tiles and or carpet, even vinyl is pushing you up a couple of millimetres. Uh, and that is getting you up above the, the very base of the bottom plate sitting on the slab. Uh, so changing angles a little bit, putting a pen, notepad under the end of it, or using the built-in flip stand to change that direction. Uh, or just again, moving it five mil one way or the other up, down, sideways, diagonally. Uh, so each time you do it and you confirm activity, uh, pencil mark or a bit of chalk mark to indicate where you were. <laughs> now, as far as penetration is concerned, uh, depth of penetration, it, it, it all depends on the density uh, and type of material uh, that we are, we are trying to penetrate. Uh, as far as uh, timbers are concerned, uh, tests were conducted uh, with, with the radiator pine framing uh, with plasterboard on it. Uh, we've, uh, we've reached up to, up to the 85 millimeter penetration. Now, a few things do factor into that as well. Uh, it's the orientation, whether you're going um, uh, through the grain or with the grain. Uh, so obviously that will, uh, that will certainly make a little bit of a difference. Uh, to the penetration as well. Now, as we go up into our hardwoods or the, or the more dense type uh, timbers, yes, that uh, penetration is reduced. And it is reduced quite considerably depending on that timber itself. Uh, on spotted gum, uh, similar tests we used with the pine, uh, we're only achieving around the 40 to 45 millimeter uh, penetration. So it's about having a look at the construction, seeing what we're dealing with, being able to move it uh, from one side to the other. Uh, to achieve in, uh, what, what, what we're trying to set out to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, plasterboard, no issues. Uh, with that certainly will penetrate. Uh, tiles, marble, granite type material, very porous. Uh, it will penetrate. Just got to be mindful of that glossy uh, type surface. Uh, so any composite boards, uh, so chipboard, uh, MDF, form board and the like. Uh, it will penetrate. That uh, depends on, on the thickness and the type of material that it is, or the brand even at times due to glue content as to the penetrative abilities and, or how deep. Uh, but generally from what we see, uh, the most standard sizes is, is only sort of going up to the, the 20 millimeter or 22 millimeter um, in some instances, and, and it'll certainly penetrate that. Now the concrete blocks, uh, bricks, uh, yes, it can uh, penetrate those. 
uh, standard clay house brick. It will go sideways <coughs> through that. Uh, it won't go through two bricks on a cavity brick situation, but getting to that cavity is what we're trying to achieve, um, seeing what's going on in there. So yes, it will do that. Concrete blocks, if it's an open core, yes, you will get into the center of that core. Uh, however, if it's a core filled, uh, you won't be going all the way through. All right, but as we know, termites will utilize mortar joints uh, and cracking. They need 0.4 of a, a millimeter gap to be able to uh, to achieve access uh, through an area. So obviously, being able to do that in those areas is a uh, is a benefit as well. All right, so limitations of the radar. There is two main limitations uh, that we do have to deal with. The first one is being metallic objects. Uh, so metallic objects, microwaves cannot penetrate. It will bounce off. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, it will move around, it will reflect, it will bounce off other items. Uh, as a result of that, what can happen is we can get some sort of patterns in the radar section uh, on our screen, uh, which can at times be a little bit confusing. Uh, but obviously, we do need to understand our construction, uh, approximate age of building to whether or not there is sarking, for example. Uh, whatever you want to call it, builder's wrap, condensation, vapor barrier, and the, and the like, uh, which is on the external external framing side of uh, every home in Australia built since um, about the mid-80s. So it's, it's, it's been in there. So, so understanding that, um, knowing what's going on, but then understanding the patterns to being able to interpret that data as well uh, can alleviate any issues uh, that we may or may not have with uh, patterns. Our moisture is the other limitation to microwave technology. Uh, moisture will absorb microwave energy. As moisture increases, the absorption rate increases with it. Uh, with that absorption, what we're witnessing on our screen is the signal gets smaller and smaller uh, to a point where we cannot establish or interpret the data. Now, we're finding up around the 25% and above mark uh, is too much moisture in that area for the radar to give us a successful reading or a large enough reading for interpretation, which is not an issue uh, as such. Um, moisture does not mean necessarily that it's termites. Yes, moisture is conducive condition to termites, but it does not mean there is termites there. All right, so what we need to do is use the moisture sensor to highlight the extremities of that moisture area, and then we can use the, the radar sensor, uh, checking for any activity traveling uh, into or out of uh, that moisture zone. Well, so it is a little process to do, it doesn't take too long. Uh, and when we get onto the moisture sensor uh, area, we do, do have a good little video uh, that I will play, which will highlight that whole scenario, uh, how we can go about that as well. So with anything, uh, any device, there are always limitations, uh, but it's understanding those limitations. Once you understand a limitation, you know how to work around it. <laughs> it's even with people, people have limitations. Uh, so, and obviously, uh, if you have employees, you know you play to your employees' strengths. Uh, you don't send out someone with a limitation in a certain area to do that particular job, you send them to their strengths. So, it's understanding that and working around it. So, on the radar screen itself, uh, on our Android, what we're seeing is uh, there's two main sections that you'll notice. The upper section is a termed radar, it's a grid pattern, uh, and then underneath it uh, is a bar graph. So what they are, instantaneous movement. We get a blue flash traveling out from the left, flicker, 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 as per movement. And then we get the pattern in the uh, grid zone, which will travel from the right over towards the left. End to end of that box is a 10 second interval. So that can certainly help us um, with activity levels, uh, whether or not there's grouping walking through, you get a break and then more patterns and so forth, or it's a continual stream. Uh, 
Uh, so depending on the scenario, will depend on what's going to happen there for us. Uh, and it's within that section uh, that we need to interpret that data uh, to work out exactly what is moving, uh, what is creating that, that pattern. Now the shake section, uh, that's an accelerometer, if you will. Uh, so that's detecting excess movement of the device itself. If you have any patterns within that shake grid uh, or in the, the bar graph below it, you need to reposition it, hold it a different way, move it to uh, uh, a different area, use a solid platform, for example. Uh, we do not want anything in that area. If we do, we cannot rely on the results in the radar uh, because it will correspond or travel into that. All right, so what we're looking at on the screen, that's essentially what we want. We don't want anything in the shake, we only want it in radar. So gain control goes from one up to 10. Um, that, that essentially is just governing what we're looking at on the screen. It does not adjust the output, the emission output. It does not increase that in any way. Uh, consider that to be a volume button. And we need to adjust that gain level uh, to a level where we can interpret it. Uh, as everyone's eyes and focus and, and so forth are, are different. Um, it's an individual thing and there's no set set figure for that gain to be on. Uh, it's a situational basis uh, and then it's up to you to be able to work into that. So, but in saying that, I always recommend that we, we're starting on around five or six. Uh, to be honest, I'm generally using my device on six or seven most of the time uh, and then adjusting it up and down as needed. If the movement is, is closer to the surface of the material uh, where you've got the unit sitting, you may need to turn it down. Uh, if it's deeper or a little bit more moisture involved, um, we need to turn that gain level up. Now, what we do find though, we're turning the gain level up, uh, eight, nine or 10 setting does become a little bit more difficult to hold steady. We can put some vibrationary patterns into the device, even without setting the shake section off. Uh, and there are other, other um, objects which can create that issue for us as well. Uh, air conditioning units humming, uh, using it on a desk or a floor where a computer tower is, um, ceiling fans, fridges, washing machines, any mechanical vibration, um, then sending those uh, vibration frequency through the material that we're resting on can give us slight vibrations in the radar section with nothing in the shape. Um, so we do need to be mindful of that. It does come down to interpretation of data. Uh, and I also do have a little video coming up soon showing you a few things that I do uh, which can easily rule out um, outside influence of the uh, of the device. So it's all practice as far as holding it, getting used to holding it. Uh, there is no right or wrong way to hold it other than holding it steady at the end of the day. Um, it, so it, it, is, it is something which you do need to practice more and more, different positions, find that comfortable spot for yourself. So just reiterating with the gain setting, it does not increase the emission. It remains constant. It is a volume button. It's magnifying the display screen. That is it. So if we're looking at these, these images on the screen, we're going from three to six to nine. If we have a look at the radar pattern in the grid section, it's getting larger and larger. Uh, on the left in three, that's too small. Yes, it's giving us some faint, faint ripples, but we don't know what that is because we cannot interpret it. Uh, nine, too large. It's expanding it. It's bunching it up. It's cutting it off. So think of that as distortion. All right. So again, finding that sweet spot for yourself. It's the same as uh, watching television or having a radio on. You don't have it that low on the volume that you've got to struggle to hear it. Uh, and I'm not talking about uh, with subtitles either, by the way. Um, and you don't turn it up that high that it's uh, distorting the sound quality. So you turn it to a level where it's uh, sufficient for you or comfortable for you. So this little video will show you that. So this is the test scenario. Turn track set up on uh, test timber. Off screen to the left, we have some artificial movement. It is moving at the same speed and it remains distant, uh, constant distance from the uh, device. Uh, and then note through the video uh, that the gain level is being, being changed and then just note what's happening on the uh, on the screen when that happens.
All right, so as you, as you uh, hopefully saw there, you can, um, uh, you could clearly see what was happening um, as the gain level was being moved up and down. So again, it's just getting it to that sweet spot where it is comfortable for you personally. So as far as positioning the device, again, there is no right or wrong way uh, to do that. It's about just having it uh, steady and not moving. Obviously, there are some instances where we need to get higher than where we're standing or able to reach. Uh, trying to stretch out your arms and so forth uh, does make it problematic to hold steady. So having other devices at your disposal certainly helps. Uh, you can get through Termitrack tripods, which extend to about three metres uh, in height. Uh, perfect for getting up to uh, ceilings. <clears throat> if you will, uh, corners, lines, exposed beams and such. Uh, and also monopods. Uh, monopods are there. Monopod isn't, isn't essentially a device where you're going to hook it up and hold it. Uh, it's a positioning device as well. They extend out 1.2 metres or so, uh, but great for getting into those tight spots where you physically can't reach. Uh, so it just gives you a, an extension of your arm. If you will, so very handy in roof voids at times, or getting in behind benches and such, uh, or on walls, you can have some stability feet as well, uh, and and utilise the device. But there is a built-in flip stand uh, on the device, so that's great for for, for down along um, skirting lines and bottom plates and such. Uh, or use whatever's at your disposal uh, to get it where it needs to be: books, boxes, uh, the box that comes in, uh, chair, whatever you have. Is, uh, is okay to utilise. All right, so the interpretation of the data, and essentially that's all it is. It is just data that has been given to us um, by the unit, uh, and then it's up to us to, to interpret it uh, correctly. So there are a few things within these patterns which we're looking at. Um, which we need to identify, which certainly helps us with uh, with what creature is actually making that movement, or, or whether or not it's vibration uh, or not. <clears throat> so, in one sense, with termites, uh, they are quite unique, sort of a creature, um, as in the way they are built across the board. Uh, the way they move is very is very consistent uh, across the board as well. Yes, we know termites are different shape, heads, mandibles, and, and the like, but the, the crux of them is, is built the same, the way they're carrying their bodies, walking along, and so forth. It is very, very similar. Uh, so this is how we've come up uh, with what we have, looking at these patterns uh, to decipher them and help us interpret them. Obviously, there are slight variations um, in different scenarios, of course, uh, which could be due to numbers or how much material you're going through, moisture content, and the like. But generally speaking, if you break it all down, uh, you'll start to see the similarities uh, within it. So we'll talk about the screen on the left. This is uh, C S and S formus, uh, which we should uh, we should all be familiar with, um, particularly in uh, in Australia here. Uh, so we'll talk about this pattern. We'll forget about these spikes. So from the grid on the second, from the right, and third from the left, we'll, we'll talk in between those. We'll talk about the spikes and what they mean in a moment. All right, so termites uh, in their workings, in their galleries, uh, in their nesting area, they do they do waddle along, they do elephant trail. Uh, they are a touchy-feely creature as they put wasting energy and pheromones everywhere uh, that you don't need to. So termites do operate a lot with that, uh, a lot with that feel, uh, traveling side by side or head to tail uh, and so forth going along. So that sort of helps us in these patterns as well. Now, what you will notice uh, on it, we're going to break it into a a valley or a low, uh, and then a peak. So that be essentially becomes a section. That's the full movement of travelling through the field of view. All right. So bear in mind here that it is moving from the right to the left. Um, this pattern. So when we're having the movement within the field of view itself, we're on the low side. I said earlier, moisture absorbs. Uh, the radar or, or the emission 
on it and the more creatures you have the more absorption you're going to have so essentially what it's trying to do is bring that down to a flat line uh, on us and then when we get a break in movement which is usually the break in moisture of the creature itself then it gives a spike there's a release of energy uh, and we get a spike but what we notice is you'll see that that what happened secondary here in the peak is very very similar to what's happened um, on the preceding uh, valley if you will so if we break that down into twos the valley and a peak all the way through here you'll start to see the similarity with that pattern traveling through all right so as i'm moving the cursor around with those two you should be able to start to see those similarities coming in now that's that's consistency which um of a pattern which i do sort of refer to quite a bit so whilst on the surface it may look inconsistent or quite random it's not if we break it down uh, into those subtle details and then the further along we go uh, you can see that happening again so in these ones here turning it upside down and also this one all right so all that is in there uh, for us to look it's obviously not an exact science here this is just observations which we have been made over the years uh, of using the device however it is a pretty it is a pretty accurate assertion uh, as to what we are viewing here on the uh, on the screen now the spiky parts that is generally indicating higher aggregation or activity in a particular area the reason we are getting that is uh, more numbers equals more moisture uh, which equals more absorption so it's trying to drag that pattern down again to a flat line and then when you get a break in that moisture that, uh, it's a larger release uh, so basic physics involved there for uh, every every action there's an equal and opposite reaction involved so hence getting those spikes in those uh, in certain areas is a good thing it's telling us something uh, if you understand uh, your target genus uh, termites as well that can also be a big thing uh, we know certain genus in particular they herd together uh, or they travel side by side as opposed to nose tail uh, purely due to the way they, they consume uh, the material they're eating and so forth so knowing all of that certainly helps but also watching those spikes come in uh, is telling us that we are closer uh, to to that heavier traffic or aggregation for example uh, junctions of noggins to studs where there is excess nails uh, we do know with termites traveling up through studs they get to those areas we do get a bit more aggregation uh, whether it, whether it's uh, mineral extraction um, uh, not from the nails, slight corrosion and so forth in the nails, which termites can use in their diet, being a nutrient deficient creature. Uh, also getting closer to entrance points and such. So all of that does tell us a story uh, and we need to know that. Uh, all of that helps us with our determination on how we're going to treat the active, active uh, termites within the structure at the time. Um, as I said earlier, we're spoiled for choice with products that we can use. Uh, and obviously our first first most idea should be colony elimination, uh, not chasing from that particular area. So again, the importance of tracking termites and we note these things. So with a pencil or a chalk, if you come across high aggregation areas or activity areas, just note it uh, on the wall where you're leaving your marks. Then when you finish scanning a particular area or room or, or a wall within a room, then you can stand back and look at all your marks and then it gives you a larger broad scale picture on what's going on uh, you may say oh why are they traveling this particular area well there is a water pipe in there for example uh, or you're coming over to the corner where a roof valley is uh, there may be more condensation in that wall and so forth so there's a whole group of factors there putting together that we can utilize if we've taken our marks as opposed to just going along, putting it on a wall, going, ah, oh, yep, that's activity, putting it somewhere else random, that's activity. You want each and every spot exactly marked. And it will tell you a story. And it's from that you can make up your mind the best course of action um, to treat that activity. Again, not just slapping down something willy-nilly and hoping that the termites will get it, but put it in a position where you stand the best chance um of, of termites being treated correctly or particularly with baits that they're going to be feeding on it quite quickly so yes it does take time uh, but we do need to do it now another thing which i always do um 
as far as my assertions and interpretation of the, 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 the data involved with it, we may have some mechanical vibration um, in walls. It may be us, um, not quite steady enough, uh, getting a little bit, of, little bit of vibration through the device. So there are ways we can rule that out. Um, if we're thinking it's us, uh, just move off the position you are. Hold it in the same manner, but a different position, random position. If you're getting the same marks, there's a good chance that it may be you uh, doing it. If it if it if it is changed, well, obviously we can we can uh, we can rule those things out um, at all, whether it is activity or or, or you as such. Uh, but also ruling out mechanical vibration or metal reflection and so uh, it, it can be difficult because they can be random type patterns. So always look at your environment first. Uh, if you are close by the kitchen area or fridge on or washing machine laundry, for example, um, ask your client if you can turn it off. Just explain, look, it can't upset what we're trying to achieve. I need to turn it off for the, the, the moment. <laughs> but another thing I do is manipulate the data. And I'm manipulating the data by manipulating a response or, or trying to garner a, a, a response from the termites. Um, and, and termites are a fairly defenseless creature, as we know. Uh, they're not not really an aggressive type of uh, a creature. The soldiers are purely there to uh, to block off breaches um, in the termite workings uh, to enable enough time for the workers to uh, get down a bit further and seal the area off as as such. So they're very attuned to excess vibrations in their area. Uh, studies have shown that termites are a very soft-footed creature in the way they walk, very tiptoey. Um, and that enables them for a few things. Um, it makes it more difficult for, for predators as such, in particular ants, to, to pinpoint their location. Um, because they are soft-footed creatures, the wall, they can't hear them, they can smell them, uh, can't see them, uh, but they, 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 they can't pinpoint where they are. Uh, but also it enables the termites to, to recognise any, any other vibration or heavier vibration um, outside of their colony members, outside of the working. Um, so that could be predatorial ants trying to make their way in uh, to a working area. Uh, or it could be they've eaten too much of the timber they're consuming and it's creaking and groaning. So it triggers a response um, for those termites uh, to do something, whether more workers come to the area or the workers are stopped from that area, more soldiers come and so forth. So to trigger that response uh, from termites, we just tap around the area. Back before any of these devices were uh, were available to us, uh, we're using shot glasses with your ear against the wall or stethoscopes. Hopefully, you all still carry stethoscopes with you, but listening to them, tap around the wall, and then you'd hear them. Different genus do it differently. We have head tapping, we have body vibrations, and and so forth, or a combination of each. But we get that happening. Termites will react. That is part of their defence mechanism. Uh, part of this skittish type of uh, nature uh, that they actually have. So doing that will trigger that response so you will immediately get an increase in activity uh, due to that excess vibration or head tapping as such. And then we're watching the screen when we do it. Uh, so if there is a change after us initially tapping uh, on it, it's safe to say that it will be termites. Uh, and have a look, uh, it should increase uh, to start with, but then that pattern may get smaller and lower uh, purely through they might think it's dangerous, so they're trying to uh, they're trying to uh, keep themselves from that area until everything calms down. So watch that happen, and then after a little while, you may see that activity level uh, come back into the line again, uh, get getting larger. So we can uh, we can witness that happening on the screen. So again, that's a, another very good way to help us with our uh, interpretation. Now, ants don't tend to uh, react uh, to that outside influence, if you will, on the surface. Uh, as we know, ants are very atmospheric, uh, pressure change respondent. So, if you blow hot air on them or in their working area and you punch a screwdriver in, changing that atmosphere, that's atmospheric pressure, they'll come rushing out and so forth. But tapping around over them, they tend not to care. They're a little bit more bravado, uh, if you will. Uh, ants also, a few other things with their patterns uh, going on, they do have a harder exoskeleton, so there is a little bit more reflection of the microwaves. So what we find on their patterns is uh, we're not getting little 
plateaus or little flat spots on these peaks and valleys as we're seeing here. Uh, collectively, they are very triangular all the way through, very peaked, crisp peak all the way through. Uh, and there is no uh, sort of consistency with ants. It, it, it depends on the type of species uh, that you're dealing with. It also depends on uh, colony uh, numbers and so forth, time of day, temperature, all of that really affects ants in that sense. Even within species themselves, the differentiate um, differentials that we do get from their patterns is incredible, uh, purely due to that random, uh, or what appears to us to be quite random behaviour of, uh, of ants just scooting everywhere. But as we know, they all have their job to play uh, or their role to play in the colony and, they, and they're doing just that. So there's little subtle differences like that we can see uh, going through. So that little tapping away can here help us rule out uh, ants, it can rule out uh, metal vibration or metal reflection, sorry, uh, mechanical vibration uh, and, and so forth. So you utilize all of that. Now, if you believe it is mechanical vibration, what you can do is have a look around what's close to you. What have I missed? What is something that's on that could be creating that vibration? Uh, if you do notice something close by, find the power switch, turn it off, and then watch what happens on your screen. If it's a mechanical vibration creating that sort of pattern, it will then disappear when you turn it off. Turn it back on, confirm it. It'll come back in, turn it off, so forth. So there can be a little bit of a process of elimination, uh, involved, but all of the techniques and the factors uh, for us to come up with the correct assumption or assertion as to what that data is telling us. Uh, it all comes to with time, with practice. The more you use it, the more you see it, particularly different scenarios uh, and so forth, the easier uh, it does become. So driving termites, um, this, this footage here I took, uh, I took some years back. Uh, in Hawaii, uh, we do get the West Indian drywood termite um, in, here in, in uh, Queensland. Uh, a few other places in Australia, they have bad reports over the years, but very common other parts of the world as well. Uh, drywood termites, whilst yes, it's still a termite, they're still going to give us a pattern. Uh, the, the pattern is very, very similar again. There is a consistency with it. Uh, if we break that down again, but what we find is the pattern is a little bit smaller. Um, than subterraneans uh, and or damp woods, generally due to the nature of, uh, of these termites themselves. Uh, they're a very lazy termite, uh, we've found. Uh, they tend to just sort of kick back very cruisy in their nature, walk a little bit slower. Uh, and also there's a lot less numbers uh, within a colony uh, of these guys as well. So all in all there, the patterns are a little bit smaller uh, than what we'd uh, normally experience or witness uh, with subterraneans, for example. But uh, it is still identifiable as a termite pattern. Well, out of these guys, yes, we can also manipulate uh, that data as well by scratching on the surface, as we know. Um, or you may not know the way drywood termites eat up, they're really sculpting that timber. There's no mudding in there, uh, per se. Uh, and also just a scratch on the surface can create enough nuisance or annoyance to them to, to trigger that reaction uh, as well. So look, whilst there is a little bit in it, uh, don't be daunted by any of that, uh, but it still takes our knowledge and our experience to work out what's going on. So don't fall into the trap of just seeing anything movement or, or what appears to be movement through a pattern and calling it termites, okay? Do take your time. Uh, think about it logically um, with everything I've sort of mentioned as well, but you may also come up with some other techniques or uh, tips which you like to do as well, and, and that's all good. There is no right or wrong there other than getting the correct answer at the end of the day. Uh, and don't be, uh, don't be shy or embarrassed to say at this point in time it's inconclusive uh, due, due to whatever reason it is. <coughs> as I said, this device only reduces the need for invasive inspections at times, but it doesn't remove it altogether. So there are some instances where you just have to drill a hole and pop a boroscope in uh, or open a section and visually see uh, what's what's actually going on. So everything is time and practice. So let's play this little video here. So this was an active uh, scenario uh, that I came into. Uh, so there was extensive activity throughout this structure. 
and the majority of it uh, was end up found uh, by utilising the term track. Uh, spent many, many hours on this building tracking them into uh, various re areas. So we'll just play this. There's a few things in here worth worth mentioning um, and uh, hopefully you'll get something out of it and it might fill in a few blanks for you. Okay, so now we're back in a different section of home. Now, I highlighted this area this morning. Uh, it actually was highlighted this area by a very clever little dog. So we come back to this area of the radar first up. Now, you can see I've got marks looking up here. So I spent a little time this morning. All these marks have indicated activity. So there's a double stud in here behind the door frame. So I've indicated that. Now, if we look at the pattern here, it's a lot more intensity than what we were actually getting uh, previously in that other section where the moisture. Now, I'm just going to move it up a couple of these other marks, which I knew I had this morning. I'll come up a bit higher here. I'll put on the same mark. And I'll just hold that there nice and steady. I'll stop talking for the moment and we'll look at the pattern. Right, so that instance, we need to turn that pattern down. I'll drop that down to six even. Very healthy. But what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to move it sideways off that area. So you see now what's happening is that's going down to a flat line. The reason I've done that is to rule out if there's any shaking with me, creating vibration to give us a pattern. And it just a little bit there now for me talking. If I'm not talking, you'll see that's coming back flat. I'll go back to it now. <coughs> there we go, getting that heavy intensity again. All right, so hopefully that's a brief explanation for you and you understand exactly what we're trying to do with moisture areas then checking in for uh, termite activity leading to moisture, but also a series of marks. So each of these marks are stepping stones, and that's showing me, we go all the way up here, we've got up to this point here. Now there is another room adjacent to this entrance where we are getting activity, quite heavy activity. So what we're trying to do now is work out where have they entered this structure, once I've done this process, then we'll work out the best way to treat it. All right, okay, it's next time. Have a good day, everyone. All right, so hopefully that may have filled in a few blanks for you, seeing there in particular not talking while we're using the device. So if, you, uh, if your client uh, is one of those proverbial shadows, uh, that we do sort of come across and like to talk about uh, anything and everything all the way through, wanting to know the ins and outs of a chook's bum, uh, you need to let them uh, or make them understand that uh, when you're do, doing this type of uh, procedure, that's that's not what you're getting involved with. You just need to ask them to leave you alone. Uh, they can watch, but they need to stand back. Uh, you can't be talking. As you can see, when I was talking there, what was happening uh, to the pattern. Also, removing it just fractionally off the areas where you are uh, can certainly help um, with, with your determinations or, or ruling yourself out um, as putting some sort of pattern in there as well. So again, uh, it takes time, it is practice. All right, some, some people take longer than others and that's fine, right? but it's just a matter of consistent use, uh, becoming more confident um, and, and um, more proficient in your, your abilities uh, to use that device as well. Okay. All right, so that's the that's the uh, radar section, uh, everyone. So look, if you do have any questions uh, relating uh, to anything that we've just spoken about thus far, uh, please, if uh, you, you can turn your microphone on if you wish uh, and ask a question now, uh, or you can use the uh, the chat function. Um, or the go to meeting box in front of you as well, and you can type in there and we'll uh, we'll answer it for you if we can. All 
All right. So it doesn't look like anyone's got any questions. So that's either good or bad. Um, firstly, I like to be an optimist, so I'll take that as a good thing. Uh, that perhaps I may have explained things adequately for you. All right, so moving on. Moisture, something we must be doing on uh, in our, our inspections. Moisture is the root of all evil, as far as buildings are concerned, for numerous reasons. And we do need to understand that, even if you cannot see uh, any signs of, of uh, moisture ingress. Uh, or, or leaks as such. Having a quality moisture sensor can tell us what's going on beneath the surface or within that particular material, uh, which is good for many things. And um, being able to prove these things to our clients uh, makes it very good as well. So the moisture sensor on the Turbotrack, uh, hitting the little raindrop on the on the screen, uh, and that then it's going to open up the moisture sensor. It is a dual mode moisture sensor. It has a relative mode and a direct mode. So the re relative mode works on it. Essentially, it's just comparing two areas. Uh, we give it an initial uh, reference point or a start point. When we move it, it tells us uh, quite quite uh, simply and efficiently whether it moves to higher or lower moisture in comparison uh, uh, to to the initial reference point. Uh, direct mode. It's giving us an in indicative percentage value uh, of a moisture content in a particular area, showing any slight increase or decrease straight away, uh, but giving us a uh, an indicative percentage value. Um, so look, through this, I do do, do a, a, a direct comparison to a uh, Tremex uh, moisture sensor, due, purely due to that being the most common uh, within the industry and has been for many years. Uh, and globally as well, uh, it seems to be the most widely used and uh, and accepted. So part of that uh, direct comparison, uh, relative and direct. Tremex has that as well. Uh, scale one on your Tremex and Canter Plus, that is your direct scale. Scales two and three, or if you have a late model one, um, two, three, four, and five, they're your comparative readings, which have nothing to do with percentage at all. So if you're on scales two or three, or any other scale other than scale one on your Tremex, and you, you look at it and go, there you go, it's 15%, 20%, well, no, you, you're reading it incorrectly. Uh, it is a comparative scale on any other scale on your Tremex other than scale one. How these devices work, uh, it is by changes in density, uh, essentially, and I'll go into that a little bit more. So the direct moisture sensor as a dial gauge screen, we can adjust the minimum and maximum for the dials as well. 30% uh, obviously uh, indicative moisture content or 30% on average within uh, timber species, that is total fibre saturation as well. Hence for what we're doing uh, with timber and service, we, we don't really need to know, uh, is it is it 36%, 37, is it 40%, 50%? We don't need to know that. 30% is fibre saturation, it's as simple as that. 20% um, obviously is where we're, where uh, we are getting concerned. Uh, on average, it's actually around 21% across timbers, uh, which is enough moisture content to uh, promote fungal decay and spore growth if that moisture content is at that, uh, that level for a prolonged period. And obviously mould uh, can grow from uh, excess moisture as well. Right. Uh, so, we're seeing that, but we do need to understand a few things, uh, particularly the type of timber. We need to understand moisture in relation to timber. Uh, you need to understand what EMC is, the equilibrium moisture content of material. So have a, have a bit of a study for your local area. Uh, have a look, even get on to, uh, have a look on, on, uh, on the interweb here thingy that we all have. Um, do a quick Google, um, different species of timber or even in your location. Uh, for it and that'll start telling you a good picture uh, and all of that actually comes into what we're going to be calling an elevated moisture scenario at all so without knowing what EMC is um, of Tim or on a, at least on average how are you going to tell someone what's elevated moisture or not you, you can't because you don't know at the end of the day in relationship so it is more than just trying to meet her on and seeing where that needle moves to um, I believe there is not enough training in this industry as far as moisture sensing is concerned and different equipment 
uh, to be able to use in doing that. So um, there is a little bit involved and we need to fully understand and appreciate that to give the, the, the correct uh, response to our client. And that also comes very important with the uh, with the alarms we can turn on with this moisture sensor on direct because uh, we can set up at certain percentage levels for an alarm to sound. So again, we need to know what is uh, EMC, what is elevated moisture for our region, because uh, that is going to change depending on where your location is. Uh, if you're living in a high rainfall, high humidity area, that EMC is, is naturally higher. So higher levels of moisture may not be a concern as opposed to a more inland, for example, climate where there's limited rainfall, limited humidity. Your EMCs are going to be lower in that area. Hence, uh, moisture content at a lower level can be a, a problem. So we need to understand all of that, in particular, our, our located uh, or our location uh, in relation to all of that as well. So the relative mode, uh, it's quite simple to change over. Uh, here it's just, uh, you'll note on the screen, direct moisture on off button. That's turning it off, it opens up the uh, relative screen that we can see here. So it is a bar graph. It does have percentage there, but don't worry too much. That's not a fully accurate direct reading, if you will. Uh, it's more of a relative. But in this point in time, we're not really worried about percentage. Uh, if you will, we're just seeing whether any other areas um, are giving us different differing readings. Uh, now, where we're going to be using the relative uh, more so um, is on certain materials which these type of meters are going to give us inaccurate readings on. Uh, for example, uh, on concrete, um, on plasterboard over the top of brick, over the top of concrete block, uh, asbestos sheeting, um, villaboard over roughly sort of uh, the, the 16 millimeter. Uh, those types of materials, the density and, and, and the uh, composition of, of that material makes it very difficult for these um, these style of meters to give an accurate indicative percentage uh, on the direct reading, i.e. scale one on a Tremex or the direct uh, mode on the uh, on the Termotrack. So using using the the uh, scales two or three, for example on your Tremex or using the relative mode here. So yes, we're not we're not talking percentage anymore, or indicative percentage, I should say. Uh, we're just talking, is there a difference? Um, so going through a particular area, if the majority of the region or, or, or that area of your testing is reading a, a very similar level, uh, but then all of a sudden one area has got an increase in moisture um, values, Obviously, that's a concern. And we don't need to know the percentage. The Australian standards do not mention percentages in our publication. It is mentioning elevated moisture and that wraps it up under the terms of a competent inspector understands what an elevated moisture level is. So again, getting back to what I was saying earlier about understanding EMCs and so forth with timbers. Right? We need to know that to be able to make an accurate assessment of that situation. When we first open up the uh, the term track and the moisture, it runs through an ambient calibration process. So that's very good. Uh, other devices do not do that. Uh, Tremex certainly doesn't. A Tremex is set at 70% humidity value. So any increase over 70% humidity for when you're using a Tremex, that naturally will increase the reading that you're going to have on uh, on scale one. Although it is not true and correct because it's the humidity which taking it uh, excessively high, if you will. Uh, the term track doing this ambient calibration, it factors all of that into the equation. So it is, it does make it that little bit more accurate in that sense. Uh, you do not have to do your calculations um, as you should with your Tremex if you're above 70% or below 70%. Um, so in case you aren't aware, the Tremex uh, actually has a little booklet that comes with the device, very handy to read to give you an understanding on how to use that device. And there is a ready reckoner in there to explain to you what happens or what you're looking at on the screen if you are above a certain percentage of uh, humidity value. Um, so very, very handy to have. We don't need to do that with the with the Turbotrack. 
Now, this point during the ambient calibration, it needs to be open to air, the sensor. The sensor isn't the black ring, it's essentially located emitter inside that area. All right, so we do need to uh, have that open to air, don't be holding it, don't have it resting on material. If you do, uh, it will alarm, it'll beep, 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 and it'll have the terms on the screen telling you that interference has been detected and it will not work accurately. So you need to exit it and reopen it, reposition it. So where that comes in, in, in great handy as well is, is being able to turn it on in a particular microenvironment within a building. Uh, coming into cooler weather, for, for example, heaters may be running, uh, getting a lot more clothes dryers running in the laundry in the morning, closed up. So that those areas are going to have a little bit more humidity in them. Uh, and now, so it's open, or other areas of the room or building. So open it in that particular room and, uh, and see what your readings are. So it's all about ac accuracy at the end of the day. So here is a direct comparison between the Tremex uh, and the Termitrack device. So, so they, they both fall under the same group of uh, devices, uh, which are known as a non-invasive non uh, dielectric moisture sensor. So non-invasive is we're not probes, we're not pushing probes into the material, uh, which are very, uh, a quality probe uh, moisture meter is a very, very handy addition to have, but obviously we can't use it on finishing timbers <laughs> or through plasterboard and so forth because <clears throat> uh, we're doing a visual inspection, uh, not an invasive, so we can't really use it. So non-invasive come involved where we put it onto the surface of the material. All right, so how they work is uh, slightly different, uh, that it's giving us their readings. Uh, so the dielectric part comes into an electrical current, uh, current is being emitted from the devices, and it is only low conductance uh, as such. So the Tremex works on an arc of conductivity, uh, which is essentially sending an impulse out of the transmitter pad through material into receiver pad. It's differences in there uh, from conductance values, which is essentially also a resistance value, which is what makes the needle move. Uh, and again, if you're on scale one, you're reading the top section on the Tremex, which says zero to 100% H2O. Uh, and then if you're on two or three uh, on this particular model, uh, you're reading that bottom scale down there, which is goes from zero points to 100 points, and that actually has the word there, comparative. All right, so two and three, bottom, uh, scale one, you're reading the upper one. Okay, now those two pads need to be on the same material at the same time. Uh, so if you're checking a stud, for example, you can't be holding it horizontally. Uh, it needs to be vertically on it. You cannot slide uh, a Tremex, uh, apart from leaving black marks or the possibility of black marks or damaging the, the rubber pads on your Tremex. They're not designed to slide. It's an analog device that needs roughly 0.37 seconds uh, to make us full uh, reading through that arc of conductivity. So if you're sliding it across the surface or along the wall, you're, you're never essentially getting an accurate reading uh, to an area. Uh, the Termitrack, however, it runs on a uh, capacitance base um, electrical field to find the level of conductance in material. Now, it exits in a straight fashion. It is quite small. Uh, the emission area, which does make it handy for very thin bits of timber uh, in certain areas, uh, but it goes out in a straight line, in and out, in and out. And there's quite a few calculations within the device itself, which comes up with the uh, indicative moisture content uh, on the device. So just the way it reads um, and, and, it, and it conducts um, the capacitance um, electricity level, if you will, in and out, uh, that allows for a little bit more accuracy because we're not going twice over the material, two different areas, like the arc of conductivity on the Tremex. It's in and out. Uh, so tiled areas, for example, um, you may have noticed using on, on tiles with the Tremex, you do get a in sudden increase straight away uh, on it. Tremex is very limited in that, um, and it, is, it seems to be a little bit more accurate than I've found using it for many years. Uh, also depth penetration, uh, we've found this to be far superior uh, than a Tremex. So we're, we're looking at up to uh, 60 millimetres and that was in tests conducted through plasterboard onto uh, radiator pine framing. So like the Tremex, uh, Termitrack being that electrical current in there, uh, it will pick up on metallic objects. So we must know again what's beneath the surface, benign is their pipes, uh, heavy cabling and, and such. Uh, so we can rule that out. Um, okay, so I've mentioned quite a, quite a few times here, indicative moisture. It's not a true and accurate moisture. 
uh, reading. It is only indicative only because non-invasive style meters are actually working on density changes within material. So if there is moisture within the material, it's filling the pores of the material, which is actually uh, increasing that density. And hence, that's how we're getting the needles to move or the readings of what we're seeing actually move. Uh, but it's not true and 100% uh, or categorical percentage. It's giving us an indicative. However, it is industry accepted uh, that these devices being an in, in indicative uh, level of moisture is accurate enough for us. Okay, as I say, uh, we cannot use probes through someone's uh, plasterboard wall or walk up to their architrave or skirting and, and start putting pinpricks everywhere. We just can't do that. Um, so that's where it's at there. So technically, we are not actually reading moisture. We are reading density changes of that material, which is indicative of elevated moisture. So that's something else that we do need to under uh, do need to understand that relationship in there. Understanding how to use uh, particular sensors, whether we're going to use a direct scale or a relative scale. And that's with either of these devices as well, the Termotrack or the Tremax. We need to understand that different material uh, and then using which sensor or which mode of the sensor in those different regions uh, to be able to tell us whether or not, yes, we believe there's an uh, elevated moisture. Uh, and then we need to write it up as such for further investigation. Uh, obviously, with the the, the Termotrack, uh, if you do find an area with elevated moisture, yes, we can save a log uh, of that moisture uh, scanned area uh, to show, so we can have a record of that uh, if you will. But also, we can flick straight over to the radar uh, if need be, and then we can check for activity, termite activity uh, that may or may not be exploiting. Uh, that, that area of moisture concern. So all in all, moisture, moisture sensing there is a little bit more involved in it uh, than what some people may, may think or appreciate. Uh, so we do need to be very mindful of that. Um, and as I said earlier, I believe there is something in this industry where there, there needs to be a little bit more of a focus uh, as far as training is concerned. Um, I, I don't know anyone training organisation thus far that goes into moisture sensors uh, as much as they should. So I'll just show this little video. This was just a promotional video uh, for Termitrack, but it will show you how you can use the moisture sensor, uh, walking pace, sliding it across the wall. It is connected to a monopod in this video, which is fantastic for getting to high uh, out of reach areas. You don't need to get a ladder or excess stretch, stretch your body out to try and get to it, uh, or squeeze behind uh, furniture and so forth. Uh, but also, even if you're testing down low uh, for moisture, you don't have to bend over as well. And you can slide it all the way across a wall uh, if you need to. Uh, being digital, it's instantaneous, the changes you are going to get. Uh, you don't have to look at the screen, you can turn the sounds on. Uh, or if you do like looking at the screen, um, two ways of doing it. If you timber sound at the same time as uh, your moisture, which is entirely up to you, your prerogative, if that's your procedures, uh, you can put a jogger strap uh, with your phone in it and on your forearm and you can see what's going on. Uh, or you can do it at a completely separate time and hold the two uh, unit in one hand on the material and your phone in the other. Okay, some groovy tunes there as well. <clears throat> uh, okay, so hopefully you can see there uh, various ways of being able to use it uh, and hooked up. Obviously, we all have our own techniques. I was just trying in that video to uh, give a bit of a broad 
uh, a broad scope to people um, or some ideas, if you will. <laughs> so obvious advantages uh, of direct media is identifying differences in moisture uh, in most materials. Uh, as I said earlier, though, we're not going to be using that on concrete or brick, uh, uh, even asbestos sheeting is, uh, as such. So it is highly accurate as well, but we do need to understand what uh, what we're actually doing. Uh, humidity values, as I say, the ambient calibration it does at startup is very good. Uh, it, it does uh, remove those inaccuracies uh, that Tremex does have uh, with elevated humidity. Uh, penetration, uh, it has uh, from our tests been shown to be more than double uh, penetration. And the majority of meters actually out uh, on the market. Uh, and slidable. Uh, obviously, you need to make sure that the, the face of your unit is clean, uh, not too much dust on the wall where you're, you're going across because you can smear that dust, uh, of course. Um, but it is, you can do that if you, uh, if you so wish in an area and it gives you accurate readings. Uh, and then also the alarms. You can turn alarms on. Uh, as you know, with the Tremex, it certainly has alarm as well. Uh, that does, uh, coincidentally, it does start beeping at 18%, which is the precursor to the magic 20% level for uh, fungal decay and, and uh, mold growth and so forth. So here we get to set up the three different percentages uh, of what you're concerned about. Uh, now that's entirely up to you whether you want that on uh, or not, but it is a uh, it can be a good option to uh, have in certain scenarios. And that's the type of sound that we will hear from them. So clearly audible, can hear it. Um, you won't miss that sound if you get your volume turned up. All right, so relative meter. So again, this is a comparison. Uh, we're going to be checking one area compared to the next or several other areas compared to a reference point uh, to, to see whether there is any elevated or decrease of moisture uh, in an area. So very, very simple to use. Um, on the, on the term track, it's placing the unit on the material, tapping anywhere on this white box on the screen, uh, references it or gives us a zero point start point. Uh, it's from there as we move it, uh, blue comes out, it's indicating that we've moved to uh, a higher level of moisture from reference. If red comes out, we've moved to a lower level of moisture from reference. So instantly we can see what's going on by that red and that blue coming out. Now we need to see peak values. Uh, we need to see where it is, the, the, the maximum or the least amount in relation to our reference point. Uh, so that, that will come into play with what gain setting we do have set up. Uh, I suggest leaving it on three. Uh, that way we'll always have enough um, room within the sensitivity levels of being able to peak. Uh, you'll be able to see the blue come all the way up and then, and then get to its maximum before it drops off and so forth. We need to see that. Uh, so you don't need to adjust the gain up and down like we do with the radar. Uh, as, as needed, but I suggest just put it on three and uh, uh, pretty much leave it from that. Very rarely would I need to go above four uh, to be able to see any, any change at all. Also, we're going to use this sensor for finding the boundaries or the extremities of a uh, elevated moisture area where we know the radar may not work due to absorption uh, of the microwave energy. Again, penetration, same as if we're using it on the direct. It's still giving us that, uh, that excess or extra penetration, if you will. And an instant reading. We can see it straight away by the red or the blue that will move, and we can see that straight away. All right, so here I've got a couple of little videos to run through here, and um, these videos will show uh, the full setup. Uh, it's giving a scenario uh, of an of a elevated uh, moisture area. Uh, knowing that I can't use the radar directly over it, but also knowing I had termites in other area of this house uh, or this building. Uh, so then being able to utilize uh, the relative to, to pinpoint uh, those extremities uh, and then using the radar from those points uh, on. Uh, so I'll just run through this video uh, and then we can, uh, we can have a little chat about that if you wish. So first thing we've got to do, is we've got to double check and watch the area. The radar doesn't work behind the shoot because it gets into it. So 
we need to highlight the peak point of the extremities of that moisture to enable us to use the radar. So we'll just go ahead and do that now. So what we're going to do, we'll just show you here when we turn on the on the moisture sensor, what happens is, is a, this is an important thing to do. Always stand the unit up, the sensor area needs to be open. So as we open the moisture here, you'll see what it's doing is running through its calibration process. It is a bit of a human day to day, there's been some rain around. So what's happening is it's going to factor that into the equation. So now we're open. So I'm just going to run it across the wall over here. Uh, and we'll see what sort of figures we're getting. So just down low. So that's not an unusual sort of a figure for where I'm located in the time of year. Now it's starting to climb up. So what I'm going to do is just roughly in this area where it is all through, just put a general, just a little pencil mark on the wall. So I'm still going along. See that's that's elevated moisture. Now we're just starting to break off. So just generally speaking, closed area, just another pencil mark. So what we have to do now, we need to flick over to the relative meter. So to do that, direct moisture on off. We're now on relative. So this is what we're going to use to pinpoint the extremities of the moist area. So all I'm going to do is roughly go back to the center of my wall uh, where I had that moisture. I will now hold that on the wall, over on anywhere in this white box. I've now referenced it to that wall area's moisture, my moisture, humidity of the day and so forth. So now I'm just sliding along the wall. You can see now red's come out, red's peaked. So that's telling me I'm to the least amount of moisture <laughs> in this area in comparison to where I referenced it. So now I'm just going to come back, sliding back towards where I referenced it. Now, just on the screen there, we see that red's just disappeared. That now has become the exact extremities of the moisture. I'm going to use that central to where my sensor is and mark the wall. So over on the wall here, you can just see this mark here. That was our extremities. This way, this mark here is our height. So along here, Roughly the size slightly changes. The extremity is here. It is quite high now. That is above the bottom plate. So it is indicating that there is quite a bit of moisture, more than likely, due to the uh, ensuite shower that is leaking. But we're going to investigate because, as we know, moisture is highly conducive to termites. They generally won't be in that high amount of moisture. However, they will come towards it as a, as a condition and usually on the fringes. So what we've got to do now, we need to get on the radar and check for any action, motion traveling to and for that area. Okay, so hopefully that showed a few things. Uh, now just to clarify a couple of things there, I, I wouldn't normally just say because there's elevated moisture or indicative elevated moisture near a uh, uh, near a bathroom or, or shower area as such to be specifically from something. The reason I have in there uh, was I had blocked the shower drain. It was a concrete hob type drain uh, or, or shower pan. Uh, and I always do block um, the drain hole and uh, run some water into it, let it sit and then see if any's leaking out and so forth. And we did have a bit of efflorescence through, uh, through the grouting. Uh, in that area, and it certainly did leak uh, water coming out into the bathroom side. So, very good chance that it was leaking into the wall cavity as well, which we did find out to be there was compromised uh, waterproofing membrane in there. So, just to clarify that for anyone thinking uh, why I uh, happened to mention that through that uh, through that video. So, so now this is the follow up. Uh, follow-up video to, to that one. Um, so now using the radar. Okay, so now there again. This is our wall where we checked out the extremities of the moisture. These marks. So what I want to do now is put the radar up. The radar here. I want to check along this area to see if we're getting any activity of termites travelling towards this moisture source. As we know, it's very very common to exploit that. 
So you see here, that's my extremities. So I'm just going to start over to the edge. I'm going to run it on the flip stand. So at that angle, what I'm doing with the emission, the motion, that's going to get down to the leading edge of the bottom plate, sort of down to the bottom. So just let that sit there. I'll move back. And it's showing a little bit of a pattern. What I'm going to do now, you'll hear this. So you see that's an intensifier from me tapping. And we'll sit back and we'll watch what happens to our pattern. So what's happened, you'll see from my me hitting it, it's disappeared. Now the pattern has changed a little bit to when we initially put it there. So that's a good indicator. The termites are there. So what I'm going to do is position this pencil. That's indicating I'm on the 45. So now I'll just move it along random areas, and if it on along the same plane. So we'll just move the screen up a bit closer. So I have gone about 12 inches or so here. Make sure we're all still. Again, we're getting a little bit of a pattern. So I'll give it a bit of a... So that was me. Now here, we can see there's so much, or the movement has certainly intensified that wee bit. Very strong indicator of termites again, traveling through there. So I'll just do one more spot. Oh, I better mark that, sorry. Just fade pencil. Come back along here, same sort of distance again. And that's indicating, so it's worth uh, investigating a bit further. We come right back down to the corner. We'll see here actually now in this corner, that pattern is a lot more. So that isn't, again, a very good indicator. They're traveling along the external wall, and then they've highlighted this moisture zone, and they're probably coming in, traveling in on small numbers to start with, uh, to investigate. Okay. So that was the simple process. Uh, those two little videos ran for about six minutes or so, purely because I'm trying to explain to the screen, obviously, uh, what's going on. But if I'm just going about my business, I don't need permission from clients uh, to do it. I can easily rub the marks off if uh, if need be. <clears throat> and I just get in there and I do it. Literally a couple of minutes of your time uh, can give you a good indication on what's going on or give you more information at least. Uh, as to what's going on in a, in a uh, specific area. So particularly for those jobs where um, you know you don't have your client right there or pre-purchase inspection, for example, or a rental, where you're finding things and you know you're not going to get an answer or a response being able to do something, uh, that can give you that little bit more information. <laughs> and obviously with moisture, we need to, uh, we need to recommend investigation um, as to what may be the cause. Uh, of that problem. So always a special purpose inspection is uh, it's going to be the recommendation in any of those areas. Okay. All right. So that's the uh, moisture sensor section. Uh, any questions relating to, uh, to any of that? Uh, I do notice we have one in the uh, chat section here. Uh, uh, Jack, uh, yeah, thank you. Very good demonstration, Jack has mentioned. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm glad that worked out well. All right. So, anyone have any uh, any questions in, uh, in relation relation to any of that? No, it doesn't sound like it. Okay, we'll, uh, oh, no, another one's come in. 
uh, you mentioned penetration and moisture sensor. Uh, how about radar? Yeah, okay, so Jack, yes, yeah, the radar, radar penetration. Uh, I did mention that in the uh, in the radar section. So what we're looking at there is um, on softwood timber uh, with plasterboard, we're, we're achieving up to about 85 millimetres in depth penetration. Um, and then as you go up in the density of material, particularly in the hardwoods, that does reduce um, quite a, quite a bit there. Uh, we found with spotted gum, for example, uh, it was getting us down to to around the 45 millimeter penetration. Uh, but it will go through a brick side brick. I uh, have tested it with three clay pavers, um, 30 mil clay pavers stacked up on top of each other, and I was still getting a reading uh, of activity below it. So look, it does depend on the type of material, the porosity of it, uh, i.e., and also the density of the material, but also the moisture uh, the moisture content. All right, thermal sensor. Uh, sorry, have a uh, have another question. Did you find the nest in the demo? No, I did not find the nest, but I did find a hell of a lot of activity. Uh, nest could have been anywhere uh, outside of the structure, even. Um, to be honest, over 20 years I've been doing this, very, very rarely have I ever found a nest in a structure. Found lots of carpet material, lots of bivy wax um, that I can honestly say I've never actually found a queen uh, inside a structure before. Uh, so to answer that question in a nutshell, no, but lots of activity. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, thermal sensing. Um, all right, so it is a thermal sensor. It is not a thermal imaging. Um, it is not a thermal imaging camera device per se. Oh, sorry. Uh, a, another question has just come in here. Uh, where did you bait them? Uh, in this particular scenario, I did not bait them. Uh, I used uh, Sherwood's fipronil dust in uh, in this scenario uh, in that structure. I found that to be the uh, I found that to be the best course of action um, in that. And a little bit of a plug for Sherwood fipronil dust. Uh, very very good product, um, and and I do use it quite a bit. Uh, okay, so thermal technology. This is a sensor only. So if we, we look at it, that'll break down terminology. This one is a IR thermometer as opposed to a uh, thermal camera. But it is the same technology as such. Uh, however, the sensor as opposed to the camera is um, uh, a, a camera is, is reading a lot more um, heat signatures or thermal signatures in a particular area as opposed to uh, a sensor. So, so think of, uh, think of the, the, an IR thermometer only reading us on one pixel, uh, whereas a thermal camera can be reading multiple pixels at the same time so you can get a broader view uh, in certain areas. So, but it is the same technology. Uh, we're not looking for hotspots. We're not looking for heat uh, at all. We're looking for thermal anomalies, i.e changes in surface temperature. Uh, there is no penetration with thermal technology. It's not x-ray vision. Uh, it is thermal um, thermal changes on the surface and surface only. All right, now it depends on uh, quite a few factors as well uh, as to what we, we may or may not see on the structure. So we do need to understand um, how thermal technology uh, actually works to help us uh, where we're going to to apply it at that particular time. So how this works, this sensor works. Uh, there is a laser pointer I said that comes out of the uh, the bottom, so don't be pointing that in people's faces. Faces. We point that at the wall. Beside that uh, is the reading area. Uh, that reading area uh, size uh, will change depending on uh, distance from the material, which I'll explain in a moment uh, on it. 
<laughs> and on this device we're getting a numerical value difference. So it is a relative sensor, if you will. So we give it a reference or a start point, uh, and it's from that reference or start point, then when we do move it, uh, it's going to tell us whether there's a change in surface temperature, uh, whether higher or lower. All right, so advantage of the thermal sensor, it's, it's enabling us to see what uh, what surface temperature we are getting in certain areas at all. Uh, so again, the, the big difference between uh, a thermal camera and this thermal sensor, although it is the same technology as such, uh, we're not, essentially not having a thermogram. Uh, but with that thermogram, it actually comes into play that you need to understand what you're looking at on that thermogram as well. Uh, it's not just a, a matter of a screen with pretty pictures and colours on there. You need to know what's going on, the relationship of the whole lot on the screen. Uh, and, and personally, as, as well, grey gray shading um, on a thermal camera for what we're doing with minute changes in temperature uh, is probably going to give you a more accurate reading uh, and result than the full colour spectrum as well. Uh, full colour spectrum is very good uh for use on on uh high temperature differential uh areas uh, but for building use what we're doing uh, personally i find gray shading to be uh, far superior uh in that sense but thermograms yes it's giving us a picture um and it can give us a thousand words but uh, that also can be open to misinterpretation whereas a numerical value which is all we're getting with the Thermotrack thermal sensor uh, there is no room uh, for error or misinterpretation. You point it at the material, you set the reference point, you move it, it tells you one way or the other. It tells you exactly by how much difference in that area. It does not auto refresh uh, to average temperature in the uh, reading area. We are actually um, referencing ourselves when we need to reference it. So as we move through a wall or a material, it's not going to continually change. Uh, that reference point, which thermal cameras certainly do. Uh, and depending on your camera, you can change those settings and adjustments and so forth um, going through there. Uh, thermal camera as well, due to that thermo thermogram, it's very critical to understand uh, emissivity settings uh, due to uh, the material's ability to uh, uh, radiate uh, heat, if you will, or temperature. So understanding a whole lot of things on a camera involved through the specs of the camera uh, does come into play. Uh, while you're doing your thermography course, you'll, you'll understand uh, the relationship of all of those as well, uh, which means you'll be able to use the thermal camera correctly if you have one. Uh, with this, it's taken all of that out of the equation. It's a point and shoot at the end of the day. Uh, very simple to see, very simple to read. It has a distance to spot ratio. All thermal technology devices does have a distance to spot ratio. Uh, and there's a lot of factors which come into play with that, particularly on cameras, because it's trying to give you all of that into a screen. Uh, the Thermotrack is giving us only the one area, uh, so the distance to spot is quite basic. It operates on a 12 to 1 ratio, uh, so that is 12 points from a material, it's a one point size. So if we break that into a measurement, uh, if I am uh, uh, 12 centimetres from a material, it's going to read a one centimetre diameter area and it's going to give me the average surface temperature within that one centimetre area. Further away I go from the material, the larger that gets. So if I'm 12 metres, it's going to be reading one metre, 12 feet, one feet, 12 inches, one inch, and so forth and so forth. So the further away you get, uh, the greater the reading area on the surface becomes. Because of that, uh, we cannot uh, be spinning around in a room uh, as such. You need to be parallel to the material that you are testing. Uh, to be able to get that accurate differentiation uh, in any surface temperature. And that actually goes with um, uh, thermal cameras as well. Uh, it's not a device to practice your ballerina pirouettes, standing in the middle of the room and spinning around in a circle. Uh, you should be moving it parallel at the correct distance for the uh, particular model camera that you may or may not be using. Again, that comes down to your understanding of the specifications of that uh, individual camera. So the Thermotrack itself only has one field of view as thermal cameras have two. Uh, we go from instantaneous field of view and then a field of view behind it. So we, Thermotrack only has the instantaneous field of view. 
in that distance to spot ratio and reading. Whereas the uh, thermal camera, yes, it does have that instantaneous and that's where it's taking its main readings from and the distance is, to spot is governed by that. Uh, but then it's also giving the excess uh, shadings and temperature variations uh, within its other field of view. So again, uh, with fully, without fully understanding thermography uh, and the relationship of physics to what you're looking at on the screen there, uh, that can create problems for some people. Um, so again, doing a thermography course is uh, highly advantageous uh, in that sense. Uh, there is a gain function or gain setting uh, with the thermal camera, uh, thermal sensor on the Thermatrack. Now what that's doing is altering the surface area range. Uh, so essentially it's reading a, a closer group or a larger group. So if we look at it in the respect of if I turn the gain up to 10, it's reading a one degree surface range. So when I'm using the device, if there is only a one degree change uh, and I'm on the one degree surface area range on gain level 10, it'll fill the whole box with blue or red, depending on which way, high or lower. But the numeral will still be reading one degree, whether minus or positive. Now, if I, in the same area, if I move the gain level down to level one, it operates at 120 degree surface area range. Now that one degree is only gonna move the red or the blue fractionally. So it's only there to, to catch attention to our eye, but the numeral will still show a one degree in that area, so that doesn't change. So realistically, it does not matter where your gain level is uh, on the thermal sensor, because you can see peak values uh, through the numerals itself, and that's what we need to be looking at anyway. All right. However, in saying that, uh, from factory, you'll notice the gain level uh, is normally on, on gain level set seven. Just leave it there. Uh, if you will. It'll give you enough for your point of contact for your eyes, uh, the red or the blue, but then you've got to look up at the figures anyway to see what the difference is. Now with all thermal technology, uh, whether it's this sensor or thermal camera, if you get any anomalies uh, on that surface temperature, uh, and bear in mind it's not x-ray vision, you're not going to see a termite walking um, in, in a working area. Uh, you need to investigate further. Uh, same as moisture, we need to recommend uh, further invasive inspection, uh, see what's going on. But again, another advantage of the Turbotrack is uh, you can flick over to radar and check for movement in that particular area. So that's something that a thermal camera cannot do for you uh, as well. So key points here, we're not looking for heat, we're not looking for hotspot, we're looking for surface temperature changes. Um, and quite honestly, with, with subterranean termites, with their mudding and moisture retention, uh, more often than not, in certain areas, you'll, it'll actually be giving us a cooler uh, reading on the surface uh, with excess mudding as well. All right, so look, there is not a lot uh, to talk about in the use of this sensor. It is a simplified uh, infrared thermometer uh, giving us clear-cut results. Uh, you may or may not use it or may or may not feel the need to use it uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but it is there, it does work, and it can be useful in, uh, in certain scenarios. All right, so any, any questions on the thermal sensor? No, fantastic, okay. All right, so there is uh, supplementary T3I reporting. Uh, that you can give to your clients. Uh, it is all done through uh, when you save a log on whatever sensor you're on, you'll note on the screen there is a save button. It saves it to that device you're using it. If you have a SIM card in your device, when you exit the app, it'll automatically upload to cloud. Uh, it's a cloud account for each individual business. Uh, it's a simple process. Uh, it requests to Termitrack and they'll, they will set you up on that. Uh, give you access and only you can access it. Uh, it's from there with that data, you can generate reports, you can add pictures of damage, for example, uh, put your company logo on, uh, you can add notes and so forth. Um, now, that can be saved to your file, uh, it can be just permanently saved in the cloud as well. 
uh, or you can print out or email a report. Now, it's not a full inspection report. Uh, it is a, a supplementary test report for the TurboTrack device itself. So you can give that as an accompaniment. There's no requirement that you have to, uh, but it can be good record keeping in certain scenarios. Um, so even if you don't generate the reports, but saving the logs, having them stored in the cloud at times can be beneficial. Uh, it's better to have it than not need it than to need it and not have it, uh, is one train of thought. So functionality is all there. It is quite simple to use. Um, I do not run into the ins and outs and so forth of that through these sessions, uh, but it is fairly easy to use if you so wish, desire to do that uh, when you get uh, set up for that cloud. Uh, from Termotrek here, they will send you a YouTube link, which is a very user-friendly uh, link showing you exactly what's going on uh, with it, and it's made by people that, uh, that know tech stuff like that as well, which that isn't me. All right, so just concluding out here, uh, we need to know our property. Uh, we need to know, uh, obviously, our experience, our knowledge, uh, not only on our target animal, or target critters, uh, but also on construction is a is a very big thing. Uh, knowing where joints and concrete can or may or may not be. Um, when was the house built? To know what sort of style it was for any additions and so forth. Uh, creating slab joints and whatnot, whatnot. Um, all of that comes into play. There is no device which is going to give us that information, there is no device which is going to do the job for us. So it's applying all of that knowledge with the tools and techniques that we have. So do your standard visual inspection. I find having the term track with me uh, straight off the bat in it, if I do find anything uh, unusual through that inspection, it's just a couple of taps of a button and I'm onto a different sensor. I'm not having to continually go backwards and forwards to my kit bag or out to the truck uh, to get other pieces of equipment. I've got it all there with me. And so that I find saves me time. Uh, and to a lot of customers which haven't seen this device, uh, it, it does turn out to be quite impressive to uh, to them as well. Obviously, we can locate areas of concern, or if we do, we can use we've got three different sensors we can utilise uh, in one device. And obviously, if we do find anything, uh, whether activity or not, uh, or moisture, whatever it may be, we need to write it up accordingly, put it on paper. Uh, how you came to this determination and so forth, and always recommend further investigation, put it in your management plan, recommend a special purpose uh, inspection. About everything is document, 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 uh, as far as we go. So, so uh, do what we're supposed to do, operating by Australian standards, uh, operating by manufacturers, uh, labels and extensions uh, as such, uh, and back up your work, uh, and that'll keep you out of trouble at the end of the day. All right, so that concludes the training session for this morning, everyone. Uh, any more information that you do need uh, or any advice or help, uh, reach out. Uh, you've got TermTrack numbers uh, called TermTrack. Everyone here uh, is knowledgeable with the device, can help you if it's more a site-specific uh, type scenario relating to the TermTrack, uh, they will refer it on to me uh, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, just bear in mind, though, uh, there at times can be a little bit of a delay from me getting to you, uh, getting back through, purely due to me having my own business up here in Brisbane. Uh, quite often I'm uh, working away. Uh, so so uh, giving you that extra bit of time at times I cannot uh, afford, but I will get back to you as soon as I can uh, in a reasonable time frame uh, as well. So. Thank you to everyone that uh, that has joined. Uh, if there's any any questions, uh, please fire uh, fire away. Uh, if anything comes up in the future uh, that you would like to uh, know, send an email. Um, send an email, uh, make a phone call, uh, and so forth. All right, okay, so we seem to have a question pop up here. Let me have a look at that. Uh, is the frame around the moisture meter covered in annual calibration if it is worn down? Uh, Eldrin, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, so essentially at this point in time, uh, when your unit comes back for calibration, all of that is looked at. Uh, it's looking at for, for security, 
uh, of any of the components on the device, uh, any, any wear and tear, um, and all of that gets replaced under the calibration fee uh, as well. So you don't, uh, you don't get a quote then to, to repair those sorts of things like happens on other devices uh, that go off calibrations. It's all inclusive uh, of, that, uh, of that calibration fee uh, as well. Uh, all right, so uh, Aaron and uh, Jack, thank you. Um, you're, you're welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elgin. Uh, appreciate your comments there. Uh, thanks for joining in. All right, to everyone, um, if there is no more questions, uh, with that, I shall bid you all farewell. Uh, let you get out. Uh, let you get out to your day, and uh, hopefully, you've all got something. You've got something out of it. Uh, if so, no one's wasted their time. You haven't. I haven't. Uh, and we're we're all ahead. So with that, I'll bid you all a farewell. Uh, have a great day, everyone.